Welcome to System and Soul, the podcast focused on the human energy that runs your business. I'm Chris White, along with my co-host, Benj Miller. All right, you guys ready? Here we go. Jake, drop that beat. Three, two, one. Steve, it is an honor to have you here, uh, but I can't break tradition, so I have to start off the same way we do with everybody. What is something, and you've written a lot of books and talked about yourself quite transparently, so, but what's one thing that we can't Google and find out about Steve Chandler? Oh, wow. Um, it might be that I spend time in psychological warfare in the military, that that was a division I was in, uh, which was great preparation for being a parent. (laughs) How many kids do you have? I have four and I had full custody raising four of my kids uh, from when they were very small. So it was quite, quite an adventure to turn that job over to me. What, uh, so was that in the military, is that kind of a war game scenario where you sit in the room and, and do war game scenarios? Some of it is that, and it's all kinds of scenarios about psychology and interrogation and finding things out from people and how to use communication whether, rather than weaponry. Uh, to achieve a result. So it's mainly how do we communicate in such a way that we don't have to resort to weapons and violence to achieve some kind of geopolitical result that was handed over to the military. So it was useful. Do you think that played a role in the psychological warfare of uh, selling? Selling. Oh, wow. Uh, I think maybe it did a little bit. Um, It really focused me a lot about the power of language. And um, certain words evoke feelings in people and certain other words don't. So when you sell to a customer or to a client, um, there are ways to phrase things um, that that work better than other ways. And I learned a lot of that in working in the army. What do you have any examples of those? Well, for example, um, I went into advertising, um, after my military career and, um, simple phrases like, if we're pitching a campaign to a client, or even if you're pitching coaching, a coaching program to a client and they already have some kind of program or they already have something going on rather than trying to say your program is wrong and dysfunctional. Uh, we may have an even better idea because people don't like to be made wrong with the choices they've made so far. Yeah. They like to, uh, be respected in that way. They've made the best choice they know how up until now, and we may have an even better idea. Instead of, we have the right idea, we'll fix that, sorry you had to do that, etc. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, That resonates for us because we talk a lot about just how we're you know, this is good, this, but what we do is a little bit of an evolution from that. It's kind of yeah, a good step. So, um, I love that you, um, we give away both of your coaching books to mm-hmm. all of our new coaches. Uh, so I've read those many times. I had no idea and I, I feel a little foolish for this, uh, how many other books you've written outside of just the, the coaching space, um, uh, how how many books are there? Because I started counting and I, I lost track. Yeah, I've lost track 
as well. Um, it's over 30. It might yeah. be 40 by now. What's I've the, got, what's the we, I had one that just came out recently, and I think that was number 40. Amazing. What is, what is the book that you, I'm going to assume that you have one of these, uh, but the book that you thought was going to be the big one that absolutely wasn't? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That's a funny question. I thought, um, I think, I think I had higher hopes. I wrote a detective novel uh, with coaching in it. It was about a guy who retires from being a detective and becomes a life coach. And uh, I had great hopes. I thought, oh, oh boy, this is going to take off. I'm going to write a whole series. Uh, with this character as the lead guy. And uh, so it's still my favorite book. And a lot of people like it, but not many have bought it. Yeah. It's called, uh, yeah, it's called The Woman Who Attracted Money. All right. Um, um, whatever you said, here's your answer was the one I was going to buy next. So um, I'm in. That sounds like fun. Uh, what, what's, are there any, like, how, how, how did you become so, such a prolific writer? Like how, is there just that much in your head that you have to get out or is it a, some, a passion that you love and you have to find the ideas? What is drive 40 books is astounding. Yeah, it's too long. It's too many. Um, uh, I like to think that it's, I, I think it was Einstein who said, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, hoping for a different result. Uh, but I don't think of it as prolific because it, it wasn't done with an eye to writing a lot of books. I never had any intention of writing more than one book, really. The first book I wrote, I thought, that's it. You know, I, I don't have anything else to say. But then ideas would come up and life would happen and I'd start to get an idea. Oh, that could be a book. And so another book. Okay, I've got two books. I never dreamed I'd have two. And it just, and, and then I would say, that's it. And then another idea would start to germinate. I'd make notes and I'd say, hey, that, that could be a book. So it's just, it was one day at a time, one idea at a time. There was never a plan to write a lot of books. And when you have an idea like that, do you go lock yourself in a cabin in the woods for a week and knock it out? Or is it just a grind over, I've, you know, an hour a day type of thing? I've tried everything. I've done the cabin thing. I've heard about authors who do that. Uh, but the most successful way for me has been just a little bit at a time, put aside a half an hour or an hour in the morning to work on the book, let it go, get on with your life. That's been the best system for me. All the authors that I talk to or coach or know, <clears throat> they all have different systems. So I don't have a system for writing a book that I can really recommend. But what works for me is a little bit at a, at a time, short chapters and, uh, short thoughts you you are the coach's coach and you know i know a lot well every coach that i know respects you greatly how how did coaching become such a centerpiece for your life and career it was not by design <clears throat> again it was pretty much by accident i was delivering seminars and i was um doing keynote talks and I was doing seminars for corporations and, and then later for small businesses. What were those talks and on? They were on leadership, sales, and, uh, communication. Okay. Goal, goal achievement, time management, that kind of thing. And then one day, this was many decades ago, you were just a, a toddler at the time this was happening uh coaching started to become a thing 
it started to become something that people knew about and they knew it worked. And so after I'd give a seminar, um, one seminar I gave, they said, can you stay over another day and coach our eight key people one hour at a time? And I said, at the time, I was really desperate for money. I had a lot of debts, but I had never really coached anyone. Um, and I, and I was about to tell them that when they said, we'll pay you the same fee as the fee we paid for your seminar the first day. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, coaching, of course. And so I just went in blind. I mean, I had no idea what to do. And they would send people in one at a time, and they'd sit across the desk in the conference room. And I had no idea what to do. I, and I just sat there and I said, well, oh, what's going on? And, uh, and, and then we were off and, uh, and I kept thinking as they sent people in one at a time that the manager who asked me to stay over would walk in and say, Hey, time out. It's been revealed to me by the first few people that, uh, you're a fraud. You're not a coach, are you? And, uh, at that time I would have to confess and say, yeah, I just thought I'd try. And he, but that never happened. And they told me later, Hey, our people really love their time with you. They got a lot out of it. And I thought, really, why would that be? How could that have happened? So I, I started including it in my seminar packages. And if you want, I'll do some coaching afterwards. And then at that time, I was starting to get coached. So I did start to get a feel for what it was like to be coached. So I started doing what my coach did. I used his questions. I used his methods. I just copied him. And that's how it all started. So I never really set out to be a coach. It was just something that people requested. And I gravitated toward it. And over time, I really fell in love with it. What was it about it that created that love connection for you? I think there is such a, a greater capacity for making a difference in someone's life when you work one-to-one -one than there is when, when you're talking to a whole group of people which I still love to do when, when I have the opportunity, but there, there's such a greater capacity to make a difference, to have someone's life change and to watch that occur and to be a partner in that. Yeah. And, um, that, that's what I love about it. Hey leader, did you know there's 261 business days in a year? And statistically, most business leaders are balancing about that many opportunities, issues, problems, bouncing around in their head at one time. So we created the261.com. Go there, put your email in, and we're gonna organize all those things and send you one daily email that's about this long. It's gonna take you about five seconds to read, but it's gonna remind you of that thing that you need to remember, that thing you need to do or schedule as a leader to be who you want to be. Go check it out, sign up, follow along, see you there. What, did you have any um, early, uh, you know, when we're just trying to figure things out, we always, it seems like we pick up on a few like tricks to remember. What, from those early days, do you remember any tricks that you picked up that stuck with you for all these years? Well, more than that, I remember what I did wrong or what I did that was ineffective that over time I had help with correcting. So in the early days, I did way too much teaching in my coaching sessions. I, I And I really felt compelled to have all these solutions. And then as time went on, um, I saw the value of the client seeing something for himself or herself rather than me um, just delivering and say, hey, do this. So um, I started to learn to 
bring out the best in the person and let them own the insights they were getting. And that was more transformational for them than if I would just give advice. Yeah, that's huge. I, I totally, uh, <laughs> totally agree with you. And, um, it is for, for people that, uh, get into coaching. I think that we're eager to prove our value and we think the way yeah. we do that is being smart. Right. Yeah. And it's way more about being kind. And I, I, I had kind of similar experience when I did some one-on-one -on -one coaching, I don't do very much anymore, but, um, we went for nine months or something and I was ready to like basically quit. And I went and talked to everybody like, uh, you know, I'm thinking about not doing this anymore. And I was floor. I thought they'd be kind of like, yeah, it's probably run its course and it's been good. Um, and I couldn't believe how much value was created for them in the process. Uh, which felt funny to me because I'm like, I just listened for, you know, 50 minutes out of an hour, you know, and, but that was so yeah. valuable to have that safe space for them to process and so much for them to be able to reveal to themselves through that space that it was a gift, which was super hard for my brain that just wants to like work on pro like I want to work on solving problems and putting solutions together. So to be there and maybe ask the right question. Uh, had just as much value. That that was a hard lesson for me to learn as well. You um in in that you know creating value and adding value, the the idea of uh you have different words for this, but winning the right to serve them as a client through the consultation of the sales process, and and how do you kind of show off in that that you're able to either ask the right questions or, or guide them, give them a tool, give them something. But then you also have this idea of making sure it's not a plastic chicken, right? That uh, we're not giving away plastic chickens that, yeah, you gave something away, but it's not really valuable. Could you give us some uh, just insight, some tips, some help? I, I Some of our coaches feel like they're a little bit stuck in the, I feel like I've given away a lot of stuff um, and it's not coming back yet phase. And so just what is the psychology of that? And then how do we make sure that we're not giving away plastic chickens? Yeah. Um, and you're referring to a, maybe to a little two minute video I did about plastic chickens. Yeah. Uh, which I'm happy to share with, with your, your group. I'm happy to send you a link to that. So they'll know what you're talking about when you say plastic chickens, but I want to make sure that if I'm giving time and attention up front to a prospective client, that they get an experience of being understood and um, my being curious and my desire to, to deeply understand what they're going through is a greater gift than me uh, providing a lot of value or doing a lot of teaching or giving a lot of advice. Um, what I found when I was selling my coaching to companies and organizations was the greatest thing that had them hire me when I found out later after a couple of consultations was uh, we hired you because you really get us. You really understand what's going on. It wasn't, we hired you because you're so smart and you're wise and you gave us a lot of good advice. Uh, we, the, we hired you because you cared, you asked lots of questions, you were curious, you wanted to know what we had tried before and why we thought it didn't work instead of telling us why you think it didn't work. And, um, and so we actually had the experience of what it would be like to work with you going forward. Mm -hmm. And so that was, um, that's the kind of connection and rapport that us, anyone selling coaching, um, when they make an, when they make that their primary focus, I want to understand their problems. I want to see what their possibilities are. I want to see if they see what's possible. 
I want to see why they don't. And I want to hear what's getting in the way of their natural creativity and their natural desire to be successful. What's in the way of that? Instead of what can I add that would make that happen? It, it, I'm noticing a theme through everything we've talked about today, which is just curiosity, both from you, for them, what the relationship should look like, even back to some of the ideas that you've had for these books. How do you foster that? Because it's, it's really easy to get numbed in the culture that we live in with other people's ideas coming into our head instead of the curiosity that seems like you live so well. I think uh, I wanted to get a, the way to foster that for me was to get a picture of um, how, how do the great detectives so, so I want to move out of the self-concept of being a teacher. And I want to move into kind of a Sherlock Holmes uh, concept. And you notice if you watch the Sherlock Holmes movies or read the books, Sherlock Holmes um, is always curious, and he solves things through questions. And when I was working with a company called Microchip Technologies. I was doing a lot of coaching there and they also had a sales trainer. So my coaching was more internal. How to communicate with other departments, how to lead, I did leadership. And this guy came in and he was teaching the sales team how to sell the product. And he wrote a book called Question-Based Selling. His name is Thomas Fries, F-R-E-E-S-E. -E -E. And I loved his book. And I read it over and over again. And it was um, Sherlock Holmes. Mm. It was like Columbo. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw Columbo. It I do remember, Sherlock. yeah. Columbo was just some average bumbling guy. But he always had one. He would, he would about be about to leave. And he'd say, I just one more question it just occurred to me you know and he would ask and and people would reveal all kinds of things that would help him solve the case and so that's the the kind of mindset or that's who i'm going to be i'm going to be like a detective i'm going to find out uh what's going wrong here or what's not optimal and why and um and i'm going to let them participate in finding that out for themselves and and that comes through questioning and it, it comes through a kind of listening that took me a long time to learn that people in our society just don't do especially in business most salespeople and most coaches that i work with they um they listen in such a way that uh, they're composing their answer while they're listening. Sure. So, so they, they miss a lot in what the person is saying. And so what I um, had to learn to do to be more effective was to show up absolutely empty without an agenda and then listen for, and, and I learned this from, Tom Chi, and I have a video of me interviewing the great Tom Chi, who's a genius. And he teaches something called listen for what you don't understand. Because most coaches listen for, oh, yeah, I get that. I can help. And then if somebody says something they don't understand, they don't want to look stupid. Mm -hmm. So, so though the prospective client will drop some kind of mysterious acronym like uh we're looking for the the olb to be stronger and so in my early days as a coach and coaches newer coaches say oh yeah olb that's can't live without that <laughs> but meanwhile you, you you said something about this and i know how to do that and so uh, let me tell you my track record and so they li they listen for something they can sound smart about instead of listening for what don't I understand in what this person is saying. 
And can I be humble and vulnerable enough to say, tell me what OLB means, I'm not familiar. Why? And tell me why it's so important to you. Uh, and then I take notes. And, um, and when I began doing that, listening wide open, and, and many times I'd go into a company and they'd say, well, what do you know about, I, I did a, I coached a company that sold aluminum pellets. So what do you know about uh, aluminum sales internationally and manufacturing and of pellets? And uh, I said, absolutely nothing, just nothing at all. Oh, okay. And, uh, but I'm not here as a pellet expert. I'm here to coach you. I'm here to coach you, the person, so that you can be as good as you can be. And you can tell me anything that would, about selling pellets that would help me do that. But I, I know nothing about your product. And that's going to help because if I were showing up as an expert on selling aluminum pellets, uh, we'd never get to you. We would all just talk about that and nothing would really change very much because you already know what most people think about your product. You already yeah. know that. Yeah. That's, that's very insightful. Thank you for sharing all that. And I'm going to go find the, the Tom Chi clip. I'm going to ask you a very specific question because you're the only guy I can ask this to, but in the coaching space, once you've had some of the conversations, like you've said, and there's, uh, if you're experiencing a lull between, yeah, it's a good idea. We should work with Steve between that. And yes, here's the date, here's the contract, whatever. What do you do in that to not feel uh, like so we, we definitely, uh, some of the questions that our coaches asked, for you, you know, how do you not be too soft of a sales guy, but not too pushy of a sales guy? How do you make sure that you're asking for the deal, but not, you know, uh, looking pushy, looking too eager, or whatever that means? One, one of the ways um, I, I like to be strong or effective in the sales process is to identify the gap between, we call this the gap conversation in our coaching school, the gap between their default future, which is, uh, would it be okay if everything just goes along like it is now? What, what would be the downside of that? And uh, because if nothing changes, it will. And I want, and I don't want to tell them, look, if, if you don't get coaching, you're profitable. I, I don't want to, I want them to tell me. So I want them to explain why this change needs to be made. We need to, because we're not making enough profit or we're not be, paying our people on time or we're not hot. We don't have enough income to hire the staff we need. And okay, so why? How big a problem is that though? You can live with that, right? No, we can't live with that. Well, why not? And so they start describing this line called default future. This is our future if we don't change anything. And I want them to get in touch with, with how unacceptable it is to have that remain the same because that reminds them of it is urgent if yeah. they want change, if people want change, they want it now. They don't want it down the road. And then, then what's the gap between default future and what's possible? So let's talk now about what's possible for you in the way of profit, income, hiring new people, and um, and how important is it to close the gap between your possible future. How important is that? Is that something you can wait for a while on? And I want them to tell me, no, we can't wait. We've got to get this started. And so then I say, so is that something you'd like to start now? Would you like me to um, save time for you, excuse me, in my calendar and lock time in so we can 
we can work now. Or if this is something you'd like to think about or talk about, that's fine with me too. I've got plenty going on. Now, now they get to answer how important it is to work now. And if you'd like to work now, let's get started. I'll, I'll put something on the calendar. We'll have a opening session. And, um, and if you'd like to wait, that's up to you. So that's, uh, that's one way of leading the sales conversation, taking leadership, finding out when they want this change to occur if and when they want the service and whether it's uh means a lot for them to start or whether they can wait i don't want to just walk away and hope that they'll realize it's important i want to ask them if it is and then um and then if there's this uh ghosting period that happens and yeah so many sales things my communicating back I never want it to be or feel to them like I'm asking whether you're going to hire me or not, because that just feels like super annoying, pressure, pushy, salesy intrusion into my busy life. I've got too much going on uh, to answer that question right now. I wish you'd quit asking it. Yeah. And, and sometimes coaches say, hey, I'm just checking in. I'm just touching base. Are you going to hire me or not? Uh, I'd love to know. And the recipient of that kind of communication is thinking, is hearing it as, I need some money. Uh, I'm trying to send my kid to college. I've got to get my car fixed. Is that going to happen or not? You need to tell me. That's how they hear it, because that's really what it is. It. So I want my follow-up communication to someone going silent to only be about serving them, only send them something that serves them. So if I say, we talked a little bit about your hiring process, I have a few more ideas on that. If you'd like to talk it over, let me know. Or um, here's an article that I got from Fast Company on something you and I talked about. I saw it this morning. I thought it could be really useful to you. I hope things are going well over there. Let me know how I can serve you. And and I also want to have anything I say about us working together not be about us working together in my follow-up communication. I want it to be about what they want, what they told me they wanted when I had my intake cons consultation. So um, when you're ready to improve your A, B, and C that you and I talked about as primary challenges, um, let me know and I'll be ready to go for you. So, so they're reading about something they they want. They're reminded that this this isn't a coaching decision they're making. This is a decision on whether they're ready to go and get into action on their problems. Right. And I always want to refer to the, they they want to read about themselves. They don't want to read about me and my coaching and my fees. I have a chapter in. Uh, my how to get clients yeah. book called nobody wants coaching. They want their problems solved. Uh, that's what they want. They don't walk around one day and say, Hey, I want, I think I want coaching. I think I want a coach to come in and work with our business. That, that, that epiphany never happens. They're walking around thinking this problem has to be solved somehow. Or we can't live this way anymore. We can't keep going on doing this. Or we can't keep losing good people because we have no culture here and we have no leadership operating principles. We're winging it uh, and we don't know what to do about that. So my 
email is going to be about operating principles and leadership consistency and communication with team members that has them want to stay on the team and not leave. That's what my email is about. It's not about, hey, when are you going to hire me? I'm, I'm a little convicted right now because I, um, I, I believe that I know everything you just said. And literally this morning, um, I have one client that I really, I, I genuinely really want to work with this organization for a bunch of reasons. And so I literally just sent an email and said, Hey, we're going to get to work together next year. So I did exactly what you told me not to. Um, uh, but it, it, what I hear you saying is go back to the gap. Like people don't want to buy a dishwasher. They want clean kitchen. Right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, before we go, I, I, I'd be a little sad if I got off here without talking about your book, Crazy Good, because I really enjoyed Crazy Good. Um, uh, listener, if you don't know Crazy Good, the idea is that most people teeter back and forth between good and bad when we have an opportunity to, to be crazy good. And you really kind of kicked that off with this idea of 5% better. So I wondered if you could talk about that a little. I'm, I'm curious, 5% just popped out of me. It's like, you didn't say 1% better because a lot of people say there's a lot of one, you know, just get 1% better and that compounds over whatever time. Uh, but that, you know, how did you get to the 5%? I was, um, I worked with a psychotherapist and a great author by the name of Nathaniel Brandon. And he's written amazing books on self-esteem. And um, I would go out to California and he would do psychotherapy sessions with me because I, I was trying to raise four kids and run a business and I was going crazy. And um, so I would come in saying, I want to be more um, compassionate with my teenage daughter. And he would say, okay, we're going to work on that. Um, we're going to do sentence stems. If you were 5% more compassionate with her, what would you, what would that look like? What would you do? Um, now, 5%, and that was his idea. That was his psychotherapeutic system. If, if he could show people that they might be 5% bolder as a salesperson. If I could be 5% more organized, I'm disorganized. If you could be 5% more organized, what would you do? Well, I'd straighten up my desk before I went home or I'd go over my tomorrow's to-do list the evening before so I could arrange it in order of priority. Uh, I could do that because within the 5% idea, the brain sees it as doable. But what most people want is how do I change from being really disorganized to being super, super organized? How do I change? What's wrong with me? Why don't I do that? And the brain can't go there. It, it, it operates with the doable. So, um, that's where I got it. He did it with me on personal issues, business issues, and he did it so often it worked. And I try to give him credit um, when I use it. I don't always, but it, was, it all came from Nathaniel Brandon, and it, it worked. Most people, I wrote about this in a book called Creator, um, about how, how to access our creativity throughout the day, not just when we water paint or play piano or, or do our little hobby after we leave work, but in every moment of the day. Am I being creative or am I being reactive? Those are my two choices. And uh, people get these polarities like, I'm bad at this, I want to be great at this. I have a bad relationship with my business partner. I want to have an amazing relationship with my business partner. And so they never go into the middle ground, which is where all achievement, all creativity happens. It's not jumping from bad to great. It's working in the middle. Like, and that's how the 5% works. If I were 5% more creative in the emails I sent, 
if I were 5% more mindful about how this email is going to land with the client, like your email, are you going to work with me next year? Yeah. Come on. My daughter needs corrective shoes. <laughs> uh, poor little thing is limping all over the place. Are you going to work with me or not? It's, it's, uh, you, you can see if you're mindful, if you step back, what if I got that email? Uh, yeah, I would think, Hey, don't try to guilt me. Don't try to bug me. I know you're out there. Uh, what are you sending me that? That doesn't serve me for you to ask me if we're going to work together. That tells me that you think that I forgot about you or I'm stupid or I, I don't know what I need. And so I asked myself, if I were 5% more mindful about how each email would land, would it land as service or would it land as sales? Yeah. Then I could alter it. And then, and that's 5% more. That's not total transformation from uh, bad emails to great emails. That's, and that's where all progress is made is in the middle between the two polarities of everything. That's so good. What are you working on being 5% better at right now? Writing books. Oh, you got some more, more in you. Yeah. What I've you got on? one. I'm, I've got one. I'm working. Uh, I'm just finishing a book, a workbook for coaches. Um, that we're just putting the final touches on. So yeah, I want to be 5% have the books have more impact, make a bigger difference, be more useful. That's beautiful. Well, you've made a, a, an enormous impact in my life through your work. Um, some of my dear friends work. So thank you. Thank you for hanging out with us. Let me just ask you one open ended question as we wrap up, you know, for specifically for the coaches that we have in our community that listen with us. What, what's the biggest piece of advice that you would, uh, or the thing to focus on maybe, um, uh, well, strike that. I had one more question I had to ask you. Do you see sales changing in any way right now? Like in the, in the post COVID economic craziness, are you seeing any changes or is it, no, just go back to the basics. Well, I think the basics the basics work, but they're harder to execute post COVID because the world is a lot more isolated. So many, so many people are um, less interactive with other human beings. And so they're feeling more isolated. So the human connection um, that needs to be made is even more vital. And a lot of people are attempting to use nothing but media, social media, and all these salesy things. Uh, when clients are longing for a true human connection, even if it's over zoom or the phone sales occur, I used to draw a circle in my sales training, every sale occurs inside a conversation. All the time I spend outside of conversation during the day is wasted time unless I'm setting up a conversation. So if I will wake up to the fact that sales occur inside a conversation, not what I do on my website, not everything I do outside a conversation. If I remember that throughout the day, then I will gravitate toward a conversation instead of just um uh, sending stuff up i love that that's a that's wonderful steve thanks for being with us today glad to be here i'm honored that you asked me well maybe we can do it again love to <laughs>